maybe that's the reason why. Okay, maybe there is sound now. I'm pretty sure there was sound on the TV repeater a moment ago. Um, yep, oh, there I am. So is that fixed at Mike? Uh, someone let me know if the sound on the uh, on YouTube has been sorted because I think I know what the problem was there. Uh, and that was a vmix thing. It's always something, isn't it? All right. Um, okay, Rob reports he sounds good on 3541, listening on Freeman's Reach SDR. Yep, thanks, Rob. Um, aha, says Rob. Okay, that's better, huh? Yep, I'm, get <laughs> I'm getting good sound reports now for the, th the YouTube stream, so um, that's fine. I won't bother repeating myself. Okay, uh, for those folks that are tuning in for the first time, this is the usual thing that I always do for uh, any newcomers desiring to do the same, although they'll be up, coming up later. Uh, dear, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, of which this broadcast is on behalf of, was founded in 1922 and is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. We have well over 1,600 members scattered about Victoria in, and Australia, some also overseas. Membership of the Society, of course, is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science to provide greater and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, which is coming up next Wednesday. And meetings start at 8pm, right on the noggin, not one minute later, uh, at the Mullia Hall Burwood Avenue in Melbourne, not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance, and also fairly close to the Melbourne Observatory on the same side there. Melbourne, yes, Melbourne. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free, visitors are most welcome of course, and uh, usually by about uh, 10 o'clock, uh, proceedings usually finish by, by about that time. There's free tea and coffee, biscuits as well, and uh, Lots of chat, they usually get about 50 to 70 people roll up at those meetings. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV magazine crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like and free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and are uh, and after the monthly meetings if weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300 mm equatorial reflector and a 300 mm portable reflector. There's a 200 mm refractor which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a 200 mm uh, and a sorry and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible too. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan scheme, uh, so members can try before you buy. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, which is a little room at the uh, back of the main house in Burwood. And I believe there's, uh, um, there's a... Uh, a plan to move on from that uh, location, the the lodge uh, at the back of the uh, the old house there at Burwood has been a, a meeting place for the ASV since practically um, somewhere in the 80s, I think. Can't remember when we got that house, and um, it's now looking at moving on to bigger digs. So uh, probably by the end of the year, perhaps uh, we will see new dwellings where the ASV can hang out, bigger rooms and uh, where the library can also go to I think. Anyway that's all being planned at this stage so um, interesting things uh, looking forward. Members are also encouraged to make the use of the society's country property located near Heathcote. Uh, that's something else I forgot to do. Um, which is some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. 
there are a range of instruments available for members to use. Uh, the larger two, of course, require some degree of training. Uh, the, there's a range from they range from 300 millimeter to 1,000 millimeter aperture. Also located on the side is an 8.5 meter steerable telescope, radio telescope, which members can access with involvement in radio astronomy section. And a very pleasant good evening to uh, to the folks of the radio astronomy section that may be listening tonight. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and, ast and astronomy in, uh, in general, all catered for one way or another. There's uh, 20 sections that make up the various activity groups within the ASV. Those sections can be found on the ASV website. Details, contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Uh, further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and notifications of events are given in, in Crux Extra Bulletin sent out via email to members. The Crux Extra is a special little newsletter that gets published every other week uh, for, uh, for members via email and it is a supplement as such to, uh, to the main uh, uh, Crux uh, newsletter if you want to call it that. Please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed if things get out of control. The, uh, you can write to, to the ASV at the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. But the website, uh, which is... Um, carrying all the information required can be found at www.asv.org.au that's www.asv.org.au membership to the society uh, is available from the home page um, click on the link where it says membership and all will be revealed all can be taken care of via PayPal and um, it's a fairly easy process uh, okay right um, looks like my audio must have been off on ATV as well when I was uh, there was no audio too I tested that you know I tested it before I came on but as soon as you press the go button things just change I don't know this this whole business I think what I might do is just go back to 80 meters only and screw the all the other modes that I use nah there's too much satisfaction in the uh, the visual side of it uh, okay, so, um, Goodera. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, VK3 Mike November has joined in to the chat window. He says, I'm 20 over 9 on 80. And uh, gives a report on 160. I'd like to uh, hear some reports on 160 amplitude modulation. You know, that's a, a mode that most transceivers do have. So, um, uh, I'd be keen to see how uh, the, uh, the local signal is on uh, on the AM mode. Okay, 14 past the hour. Uh, so okay, right, let me see, let me see. Um, oh yes, now, as I was saying, uh, we have a monthly meeting coming up this, uh, this, mo uh, this Wednesday, and uh, you can view the meeting on YouTube the Astronomical Society of Victoria has its own dedicated YouTube channel and uh, also a Facebook channel. Um, so if you're into Facebook, uh, as I am, and uh, the ASV has its own Facebook page and uh, the stream will be available at the ASV page, but also uh, on YouTube. So you can catch up with the person who's going to be doing a talk on Wednesday night 
Um, his name is Associate P Professor uh, Duan Ham Archer. I wonder if he's a ham radio operator. Anyway, this Wednesday he's going to be doing a talk on the first astronomers, how indigenous elders read the stars. That could be quite taining. Drawing on his recently launched book, The First Astronomers, How Indigenous Elders Read the Stars, uh, Duan will discuss indigenous sky knowledge. First Nation elders are expected ex expert observers of the stars. They teach that everything on the land is reflected in the sky and everything in the sky is reflected on the land. These living systems of knowledge challenge conventional ideas about the nature of science and the longevity of oral tradition. Indigenous science is dynamic, adapting to changes in the skies and on earth, pointing the way for a world facing the profound disruptions of climate change. So join the folks at the Molio Hall on April 13 from 8pm as Associate Professor Duran Hamacha, 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 maybe that's how it's pronounced, pronounced, presents his unique astro talk. So uh, you can go to the, the room. There is a request to book tickets. These are free, so you don't have to pay for them. Uh, but I think due to the COVID restrictions that are somehow still in place, uh, the there is a ticket system and if you go to the home page of the AC where I'm reading from as I speak uh, the link to the ticket um, setup is uh, is available and it's very straightforward it's just allowing uh, some sort of um, uh, indication of who will be there sort of thing how numbers and stuff like that it's a, it's a number thing but uh, nevertheless, stay home and watch it on YouTube. That's the next best thing. Thanks to Lee Green for setting up that YouTube link too. It's a little bit of work involved in that, wireless microphones, and um, I think there's at least two cameras. Mainly, I think there's mainly one, but I think there might be a second camera being employed there, but um, maybe not. <sighs> Righto, Mr. Brash. Now, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, with VK3 CSJ on the microphone. Okay, 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 okay. Just a quick rundown of our planets in the solar system for this month, since it's the 8th of April. It's still fairly early in the month. Uh, Mercury has recently completed a pass behind the Sun, but it is too close to be seen this month. Venus is the bright morning star, again this month rising, rising at around 2 a.m. Uh, in the northeast before fading in the dawn light. Earth passed the autumn equinox last month. As we move towards mid-year, our planet's axis of rotation tilted at a fixed angle of 23.5 degrees with respect to Earth's orbit will progressively lean the southern hemisphere away from the sun until once more we slip into winter. Mars is visible near bright Venus in the northeastern skies rising, rising uh, from 3 a.m. before it too is lost in the early morning light. Jupiter is bright and clear from around 3 a.m. in the east after which it will be lost in the dawn light. Saturn precedes Jupiter, rising around 12.30 a.m. in the northeast. Fainter with a slight yellow tinge, it will remain visible until lost again in the early morning light. A couple of meteor showers this month. Uh, April's main meteor shower is the Lyrids, uh, which is centered near the bright star Vega, uh, low in the north at 3 a.m. It is active from the 16th to the 25th of April, peaking on the 26th and sorry on the 22nd and 23rd of April. Better placed is the Pi Puppids associated with Comet Grig Stigelrup which peaks on the 24th of April centered low in the southwest near Canopus in Carina. Uh, okay, we'll skip all that. 
There. All right. Now, the International Space Station. If you've never seen the International Space Station, it scoots across the sky every 90 minutes, depending on where its orbit is in relation to us. Uh, the IWS orbits every 90 minutes at an average distance of 400 kilometers, appearing like a bright star moving slowly across the sky. And on Sunday the 10th of April, there is a passing at 5.50 a.m. to 5.56 a.m. coming in from the west-southwest to the northeast. And then on Monday, the very next day, on the 11th of April, it's seen again at 5.04 a.m. to 5.08 a.m. coming in from the south-southwest to the northeast. Then, on the evening of Monday the 18th, there's a passing at 7.20pm to 7.24pm, coming in from the northwest to the south-southeast. And then on Tuesday morning, or sorry, Tuesday evening, that last, I can't remember, it? That's, no, that last time was in the evening. Did I say the evening? I can't remember. But that last pass uh, was the evening, Monday the 18th, 7.20 to 724 and then again the following Tuesday evening, the 19th of April, passing at 6.32 p.m. to 6.38 p.m., coming in from the northwest to this east-southeast. But, nevertheless, there are other passings, some low in the sky, some right overhead. Uh, but you can find other information on uh, when the International Space Station is going to pass by going to Heavens Above. If you haven't explored Heavens Above yet, I would suggest exploring Heavens Above heavens above why not it's heavens actually it's heavens hyphen above but nevertheless you type in heavens above in any search engine and uh, you'll find the link it's a, uh, a free site you if you wanted to get accurate passes on any satellite or celestial object it's all there uh, you put in your latitude and longitude and uh, register by that and it's fine that the when you go to look for uh, the exact passings of your latitude and longitude, it'll be accurate to your location. Otherwise, if you don't sign up, it'll be just a generic thing for the nearest city, which will probably be Melbourne in this case. Ah, oh, good heavens above. Right, yeah. Okay, on this day. <laughs> now, I haven't, there's a few dates I've read out here. When did I get to last time? I think it was uh, Christian Huygens' uh, birthday was the last date. So... Uh, the next date here of interest is... I'll go straight to that one. Actually, what's the date? Oh, no, I've read it. Let's see. Okay. Uh, um, on the 21st of... On the 21st of April 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched on the Space Shuttle Discovery. I've got a, uh, an article on Space, uh, space uh, Hubble tonight, too, coming up. So that was the 21st of April, 1990. The 23rd of April, 1992, COBE, COBE, COBE satellite reveals the microwave temperature variation across the universe. On the 27th of April, 2002, final telemetry received from Probe Pioneer 10. 27th of April 2002, final telemetry received from Pioneer 10. 28th of April in 1900, birth of Dutch astronomer Jan, 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 I know it's not Jan, Jan Oort, O R T, uh, whose name is given to the vast cloud of icy objects thought to orbit the Sun well beyond the Kuiper Belt. On. Also on the 28th of April 2001, American Dennis Tito, T-I-T-O, Tito, wouldn't be Tito, Tito became first space tourist paying the Russian space agency 20 million US dollars to travel on a Soyuz craft to the IWS on the 8th day journey on an eight-day journey well that won't be happening again will it on the 30th of April 1006 the brightest supernova ever recorded is seen in the constellation of lupus 
30th of April 1006, that's a while ago. Brightest star ever recorded. Supernova, sorry. Alright, that's the end of that. Thank goodness. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Where the time is 25 past the hour. A very pleasant good evening to Kim, VK5 FUSE, over there in good old Adelaide. And um, VK5 MN, I mean, sorry, VK3 Mike November. That's um, that's Bruce, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry. G'day, Bruce. He's saying that Venus looks good at 4:30 a.m. Jeez, you're up. Oh, well, I didn't get to bed till that time last night, so I, so I sucked my head out the window because, well, actually, it was a bit too cloudy, I think. All right. Uh, okay. Here's the latest report on the James Webb telescope. Uh, it's actually a few days old, so there might be something new here. But nevertheless, this is what I've had sitting on the screen for the last week at least. Webb completes first multi-instrument alignment. The sixth stage of aligning NASA's James Webb Space Telescope mirrors to its scientific instruments so they will create the most accurate and focused images possible has concluded. While the mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, continues to cool down, uh, optics teams have, have successfully aligned the rest of the observatory on board instruments to Webb's mirrors. Previous alignment efforts were so accurate that the team concluded no additional adjustments to the secondary mirror are necessary until the seventh and final stage, which will involve MIRI when it has fully cooled. As a general rule, the commissioning process starts with coarse corrections and then moves into fine corrections. The early secondary mirror coarse corrections, however, were so successful that the fine corrections in the first iteration of Phase 6 were unnecessary, said Chandra Walker, Web Wave Front Sensing and Control Scientist from Ball Aerospace. This accomplishment was due to many years of planning and great teamwork among the Wavefront Sensing team. Throughout the majority of the alignment process, Webb's 18 hexagonal mirrors and secondary mirror were focused into alignment to the near-infrared camera, NICCAM, or N-I-R-C-A-M, NIRCAM, instrument only. Upon completing this most recent step, the observatory is now aligned to the Fine Guidance Sensor, FGS, and the Near Infrared Slitless Spectrograph. That's right, it's the Near Infrared Slitless Spectrograph, or NIRIS. And the Near Infrared Spectrometer, which is Near Spec, that's a bit better, as well as Near Cam. <laughs> All these bloody acronyms. Once MIR, sorry, once MIRI fully cools to its cryogenetic operating temperature in the weeks ahead, a second multi-instrument alignment will occur to make final adjustments to the instrument's mirrors if needed. When the telescope is fully aligned and able to deliver focused light to the to each instrument, a key decision meeting will occur to confirm the end of the aligning, uh, aligning the James Webb Space Telescope. The team will then transition from alignment efforts to commissioning each instrument, instrument for scientific operations, which are expected to begin this summer. That's the American summer. So it's just a, another few months away, and we should start to see some pretty impressive images and science and all sorts of interesting things coming from the James Webb Telescope. Time is 10.29. Astronomers discover the most distant galaxy yet. The uh, Space Hubble Telescope has, uh, is not letting us down here. In fact, I've got a, a bit of a graphic I can bring up here. So for those watching uh, YouTube, uh, take advantage of this. 
Um, let me go back to vMix for a moment and I'll just bring up this little graphic okay audio didn't disappear it's amazing all right what you are seeing here ladies and gentlemen is uh, astronomers may have discovered they say may astronomers may have discovered the most distant galaxy which is referred to as HD1 that's that little red splotch in the middle of the square you're seeing up there anyway the article goes like this uh, unusually bright in ultraviolet light HD1 may also set another cosmic record April 7 2022 a galaxy named HD1 has been crowned the new farthest object in the cosmos located some 13.5 billion light years away HD1 existed only about 330 million years after the Big Bang and the far-flung galaxy may be harboring another surprise too. Either population three stars, the stars born in the, uh, uh, the first stars born in the cosmos or the earliest supermassive black hole ever found. HD1 is extremely bright in ultraviolet light which is normally evidence that a galaxy is producing stars at a high rate but researchers quickly realized that even if HD1 was a starburst galaxy it would be creating over 100 stars a year this is at least 10 times higher than what we expect for galaxies for these galaxies says Fabio Pacini lead author of the MNRAS study, co-author in the discovery paper in the journal Astrophysics, um, at the, in the uh, Astrophysics Journal in a new news release. There's another, another gift, uh, another image here I want to put up too. Uh, I'll just run that. Okay. Uh, okay, now this, this is one that benefits from HD. Uh, the SD transmission up there is a little bit blurry on the small text, so YouTube watchers uh, are getting it an advantage here. Anyway, uh, so the team turned to other possibilities that might explain HD's surplus of ultraviolet light. The first stars. One possible explanation for HD's ultraviolet radiance is that the stars the galaxy is producing are different from the mundane stars produced in modern galaxies. Today, stars are made from recycled material ejected from previous generations of stars. So, every star has some heavier elements, even if just a sprinkle. But in the early universe after the Big Bang, primordial gas consisted entirely of hydrogen, helium and sampling of lithium and beryllium. From these elements, the first stars were born, known as Population 3 stars. They were more massive, more luminous and hotter than today's stars. They also perfected the mantra of live fast, die young, burning out within only a few million years. The only problem, Population 3 stars are hypothetically hypothetical as their quick lives means no direct evidence of them has ever been spotted but the recent discovery of the earliest star uh, Arendel may prove fruitful for population 3 hunters if follow-up studies find the star's composition to be entirely hydrogen and helium in the meantime while population 3 stars would easily explain HD1's brightness in the ultraviolet wavelength they aren't the only possibility. So that picture up on the screen right now is the HD1's age compared to the farthest galaxy confirmed to date. So it's a little hard to read on the repeater, but on the YouTube side of it, um, it should be reasonably clear. But the um, it's it's it marks the newly identified farthest galaxy candidate. In, in the scheme of uh, when the Big Bang uh, was kicked off some 13.8 billion years ago, 
and it's kind of that the diagram uh, kind of shows you the uh, the timeline uh, from uh, modern galaxies where we are now more or less uh, to uh, to what how far we've been able to observe uh, what uh, what ancient light is now hitting our senses so in in this particular graphic you, you can see uh, the farthest galaxy confirmed to date and then also the newly identified uh, furthest galaxy uh, candidate a candidate as well so it's an interesting little uh, diagram and uh, the next uh, slide that I've got here also to show is a uh, artist's impression um, population three stars are, is it's an artist's impression of population three stars afloat in the primordial gas uh, of the early universe and there's just one more oops one clicked on the wrong thing uh, there's one other image here and uh, again it's an artist's impression so all, all this comes from the same article <coughs> uh, another artist's concept of a galaxy in the early universe uh, where the bright center is a quasar highly luminous objects powered by massive supermassive black holes now to finish off the article uh, the earliest cosmic monster Alternatively, a supermassive black hole might explain the galaxy's ultraviolet brightness. If that's the case, the supermassive black hole would become the earliest known, breaking the previous record of some 500 million years. Supermassive black holes are believed to reside in the hearts of most galaxies, but understanding how these monsters grew to so big so quickly in the early universe remains a conundrum for scientists. Physics tells us that black holes need time to gobble up enough material to grow to a supermassive proportions, meaning that scientists didn't expect to see them so early in the cosmic timeline. But in 2017, astronomers began finding these monsters within the universe's earliest galaxies. Disks of material surrounded the black holes, and the infalling matter shone so brightly uh, the galaxies despite their extreme distances can be still seen today. It is the high energy protons from the infalling material which gets violently swirled around the black hole that might be causing HD1's ultraviolet brightness. Forming a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, a black hole in HD1 must have grown out of a massive seed at an unprecedented rate, explains MNRAS co-author Ivy Loeb. Such an early black hole may not answer the question of how these objects grew so big so quickly, but it would narrow down how soon they appeared in the early universe. So there you go. Actually, I haven't quite finished that article. I'll just quick with the paragraph, last paragraph here. James Webb Space Telescope up to the bat. To make this distant discovery, to make this distance discovery, the team spent more than 1,200 hours observing the with the Superu telescope, the Vista telescope, the UK Infrared telescope, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. I might add uh, the Superu telescope is at Mount uh, um, it's Hawaii, one of the observatories at Hawaii, Mount Kiwi. No, it's New Zealand. Mount uh, something or other, can't remember its name right now, but they've got a, uh, a, 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 um, a camera that's focused on those observatories that run all the time, day and night. And uh, the telescopes there use uh, laser um, um, imaging to improve the image from the shimmering of uh, the atmosphere. And uh, these, uh, um, this camera that overlooks the observatory up there in Hawaii you can see these lasers going off into the atmosphere. It's really quite interesting to uh, to sit there and observe for a few hours like I've done. Anyway, capable of appearing back to the first luminous glows that emerged after the Big Bang, James Webb Space Telescope will also be able to settle which theory explains HD1's ultraviolet shine and perhaps even find and find even more distant galaxies in the earliest moments of the cosmos. We can only hope that James Webb's telescope will do all that and more. You're tuned to ASV Radio. 
<coughs> broadcasting on 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band, simulcasting on AM in the medium wave service, 1865. And, uh, and there it is, also via the Melbourne television repeater, VK3RTV1, and YouTubing, and, uh, and there it is. We have, actually I haven't seen it, there's three emails that have come through, let's have a quick look. We've got a report from uh, Mr. Don Dennis, VK3HDX, whoops, wrong mouse, um, and he says that, um, what's he saying, this is not a cut but a paste. <laughs> okay, alright, that was from last week obviously. And, uh, uh, and Andrew, VK3KIS, he's uh, listening on uh, 80 meters this evening should be a fine signal on 80 and uh, we also have Ian VK3 Victor India November listening as well and he's they've all these chaps have sent uh, good reports thank you uh, for sending the reports uh, conditions on 80 are excellent tonight and um, a little bit of phasing yep okay it's good all right Thanks, guys. Anybody else wishing to send reports, uh, um, especially for the AM signal on 160? There's got to be... I know there's some folks out there on 160 listening. So, uh, yeah. All right. Time is moving along. It is 21 minutes to 11. Now, in keeping with the same uh, Hubble Space Hubble theme about how far one can see, Hubble spots the farthest star even seen. So I've got a, an image for that too. So let me just throw that up on the screen. There it is. And audio is still there. Isn't that amazing how that audio remains there? I think that's got something to do with the fact that I added the audio mark to the system. Again, thanks to Richard for that. <laughs> uh, all right. This Now, where are we? Um, Hubble spots the farthest star ever seen. <coughs> At the risk of sounding like a broken record, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has broken another record. March 30, 2022. What you're seeing on the screen there, located some 28 billion light years away, thanks to the expanding universe, this 12.9 billion year old star named Arendel, which I mentioned the name before in the last article, in fact, I'm, I should have read this one out first before the last article about the farthest galaxy. Nevertheless, it's been named Arendel. E A R E N D E L is between 50 and 500 times as massive as the sun, and millions of times as bright. I can't believe it! I just cannot believe it. The Hubble Space Telescope has imaged the most distant star ever seen, according to a study published today, March 30. Astronomers identified the supersized star, which almost certainly died in a fiery explosion nearly 13 billion years ago, thanks to a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. It took this wonderful cosmic coincidence, said astronomer Michelle Thaler of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, everything was lined up perfectly. A nearby cluster of galaxies was lensing space, actually bending space into this natural telescope. Such gravitational lenses are not always so powerful, said Brian Walsh, a PhD candidate at the John Hopkins University who led the study. He says, typically, you know, if you have a lensed galaxy, it would be magnified by a factor of a few or perhaps ten. But here, the configuration was just right, leading to an individual star at the edge of the lensed galaxy being magnified by a factor of thousands. In this case, said Walsh, we just got really lucky with the alignment. Ah, <laughs> uh, to be an astronomer. So, Arendel, meet the morning star. The new found but long dead star is officially designated as WHL 0137-LS. However, the researchers have been given the ancient beacon, the ancient beacon, the nickname Arendel, which is an old English word meaning morning star or rising light. Well, isn't that interesting? 
Just a few years ago, Hubble glimpsed another extremely far-off star named Icarus, which shone when the universe was some 9.5 billion years old, or 30% its current age. However, Arendelle smashes the record Icarus once held. Arendelle lived roughly 12.9 billion years ago, when the universe was just 6% its current age. When the light that we see from Arendelle was emitted, the universe was less than a billion years old, said co-author Victoria Strait, a postdoc at the Cosmic Dawn Centre in Copenhagen. In a press release, she says, At that time, it was 4 billion light years away from the proto-Milky Way. But during the almost 13 billion years it took to, for the light to reach us, the universe has expanded so that it now is a staggering 28 billion light years away. Arendelle shines millions of times as brightly as the sun and, mightly have, and might have weighed as much as 500 solar masses. But the researchers think it was more likely between about 50 and 100 solar masses. Stars like that don't live for very long, said Thaler. So, we are seeing light from a star that probably itself only lived a couple of million years. It blew up long, long ago. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of this wonderful gift from the universe, said Thaler. A chance to look back in time. A chance to learn more about where we come from, what things were like around here billions and billions of years ago. Moving forward, Hubble Sensor Project scientist Jennifer Wiseman is hopeful that we, that as we study it more, we'll learn about how it was formed and what it is made of and start understanding how the earlier stars in the universe contributed to their galaxies and to subsequent generations of stars like our own sun. Studying Arendelle will be a window into an era of the universe that we are unfamiliar with but that led to everything we do know, said Walsh in this press release. It's like we've been reading a really interesting book, but we started with the second chapter, <laughs> and now we have a chance to see how it all got started. Well, isn't that an interesting little story? Thanks to uh, astronomy.com for that article. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Where the time is almost 12 minutes to 11. All right, <clears throat> VK3 EKH. Right, oh, Mr. Brash. It's the second time I've said that tonight. Uh, oh, is that where? It? Oh, okay, I got rid of that. Uh, do I? Do I? Do I go with this article? Um, <laughs> Hmm, let's see, well actually it's, I've probably got time, yeah, 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 alright. Uh, now, I do have uh, one picture with this one too, let me see, it's actually, it's a Hubble night tonight, it's funny how that's worked out, but it's a very, very much a, uh, a space Hubble night, and why not? Alright, well I've got a picture of the Hubble here in full flight, um, but let's just kick off the article first. Okay, astronomy's 10-year wish list. Oh, okay, I know what this article's about. Yep, it's not all about the Hubble, but it will lead off on it in some to some degree. I have mentioned the Decadal Survey a few times in the past, and uh, the, the, the Decadal Survey is a, is a, a fairly important uh, gathering of professors and scientists and, and the like to uh, working out uh, what uh, is to be studied and how much money is involved in, in uh, scientists and astronomers uh, struggle to uh, look at the universe. So once every 10 years, uh, US astronomers publish a decadal survey listing their goals and the tools needed to accomplish them. It takes expensive tools to learn about the universe, but projects like the Very Large Array for Radio Astronomy in New Mexico and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which orbits Earth, have pushed the scientific knowledge forward in ways that would not have been possible without these instruments. 
Every 10 years, astronomers and astrophysicists outline the priorities of hardware they need in the Decadal Survey on astronomy and astrophysics. The newest version of the survey was published by the National Acad Academies, National Academies, Academies of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine in late 2021, and debates about funding are in full swing for the next fiscal year. The author here says uh, his name is Chris Empey. Chris Empey, the author, he says here that uh, he's a professor of astronomy whose research has depended on the facilities and equipment built after a recommendation um, in one of these decadal surveys and was involved in a previous survey published in 2010. The most recent wish list is full, is full of fascinating objects projects and it will be exciting to see which get funded and what research will come from them. <clears throat> Every 10 years since 1960s US astronomers and astrophysicists have gathered to create a priority list for the new facilities for new facilities and instruments. The decadal survey of astronomers is influential because it forces everyone to be on the same page and make hard choices. It has to temper ambition with realism. But then but 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 when astronomers and astrophysicists from many subfields all work together, they come up with ideas that advance the whole field. The most recent report is titled Pathways to Discovery in Astronomy and Astrophysics for the 2020s. It's directed at Congress and the three federal agencies that fund most astronomical research NASA, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy millions of dollars are at stake producing the reports is a massive undertaking involving 20 people on the main committee and over 1000 contrib contributing to the final report the committee reviewed 573 white papers all arguing for specific projects and astronomical capabilities. The finished report runs 615 pages and it's not right and it's not light reading. <laughs> this approach works some of NASA's sorry this approach works. Some of NASA's most ambitious and fruitful scientific missions like the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes were proposed in and funded through decadal surveys. So the big science, what's about? What's it all about? The committee identified 24 key science questions in the next generation of astronomy. These fall into the three major themes that are science at the biggest scale and the facilities on the which wish list are designed to address these themes. First is the study of Earth-like worlds. Thanks to the explosive growth in the discovery of exoplanets, the number of known planets outside the solar system has been doubling roughly every two years. Among the more than 5,000 known exoplanets are several hundred that are similar to Earth and could potentially support life. A major goal for the next decade is to build new telescopes on the ground and in space with instruments that can sniff the atmospheres of these Earth-like planets to try to detect gases like ox oxygen and, uh, and uh, uh, that are created by microbes. Second is to advance the multi-messenger astronomy, a relatively new field of astrophysics that makes formation about gravitational waves, elementary particles and electromagnetic radiation and combines it all to gain deeper insights into the underlying astrophysics of the universe. In this case, the need is not so much for new scientific tools, but for more grants to enable researchers to collaborate and share the data. The science goal is to learn more about cosmic explosions and mergers of compact objects like neutron stars and black holes. The final theme is the study of cosmic ecosystems, especially the origin and evolution of galaxies and the massive black holes at their centers. By looking at extremely distant galaxies, astronomers can look into the past 
since light takes time to reach Earth. So, to understand these massive complicated systems, scientists will need giant optical telescopes to find galaxies far away in a young universe, as well as radio telescopes to peer into the dusty hearts and reveal the black holes. So, the astronomers' wish list. Here are a few particularly exciting highlights from the hundreds of items on the wish list. First, the report recommends spending 1 billion US on developing technology uh, with which to build the next generation of great observatories in space. The flagship of these missions to be launched in 2040s in the 2040s with an eye-popping price tag of 11 billion dollars would be an optical telescope with a massive 20 foot 6 meter mirror. This, made, this mirror would be eight times bigger than Hubble and would, would be designed to study Earth-like planets in the other solar systems and potentially de detect life. The report also recommends building two smaller space telescopes to work at infrared and X-ray wavelengths, each at a cost of $3 billion to $5 billion. But orbital efforts are not the only aims of the report. The report also asks for funds to build a giant optical telescope on Earth with a diameter of 100 feet. <coughs> Excuse me. 25 to 30 meters. That's five to seven times the light collecting area of today's largest telescope. Two proposals are competing to build this telescope, which could, which would cost close to two billion. The report also calls for the National Science Foundation NSF to spend three billion on a new array of 263 radio telescopes. Well, I'm all for that one, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm a little bit biased on that. Uh, that would span the entire U.S. My goodness, this telescope array would produce radio images with 10 times the sensitivity and 20 times the sharpness of any previous facility, allowing scientists to see deeper into the universe and discover previously undetected objects. Another item on the wish list is a 650 million pair of microwave telescopes in Chile and Antarctica that would map the afterglow of the Big Bang. This kind of money is needed to achieve scientific goals for this scope. Pardon the pun. Finally, the state of the profession. Science is more than just the pursuit of knowledge. As part of the recent decadal surveys, astronomers and astrophysicists have taken time, sorry, have taken the opportunity to gaze inward and judge the state of the profession. These, this includes, this includes looking at diversity and inclusion, workplace climates and contributions of astronomers to education and outreach. So we all play a part. These fields are overwhelmingly white with people from minority backgrounds, making up only 4% of faculty and students. In an appendix to the report, Tim suggested a number of remedies for the lack of diversity and equi equi equity. Equality? Equality. These include ideas such as uh, better mentoring, uh, mentoring to reduce the high attrition rate for minority students, along with funding for bridge programs to help minorities get established early in their careers and to treat harassment and discrimination as forms of scientific misconduct. Even if a small part of the wish list becomes reality, it will not only increase our understanding of the universe, but also just as importantly lead to a more diverse and compassionate astronomy and astrophysics community. Good grief. Anyway, all right, fair enough. Uh, right now, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. I'm going to hold off one more article, which I've been holding up for the last two weeks, till next week. How humans pick out constellations and why that happens. Let's jump to spaceweather.com. Alright, the solar wind. 
is currently at 372.3 kilometers per second at a density of 7.2 protons per cubic centimeter. As we look at the sun, and I've got the picture of the sun here somewhere. Uh, minimize that. Uh, where's my sun? There it is. Okay. Yep. Audio still there. Uh, okay. So what you're seeing on the screen is the current disk of the sun as we speak. For those watching YouTube, you get the HD benefit because in HD you can actually make out the very, very, very fine detail of plasma that makes up that image on the surface there. But nevertheless, uh, what we're seeing there are four sunspots designated as um, AR29, uh, yep, 2987, 2985, 2978, and 2981. And uh, yes, so current sunspot number is 52, and the radio sun is currently at 117 solar flux units, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. If you go to spaceweather.com, there is an explanation of how they do the radio sun measurement at that wavelength. It is a fairly detailed article, way too long for me to read. I could probably paraphrase it just for interest's sake. I might do that at some stage. Uh, all right, back to me. This is coming up to the end of tonight's session. Um, yes, okay. So, spaceweather.com reports that an off-target CME misses Earth. A coronial mass ejects another CME missed Earth on April 7, and now a third CME is coming. Hurtled into space yesterday by an erupting filament of magnetis mag mag magnetism on the Sun. It is expected to miss Earth too. Ripples from the near miss might cause minor geomagnetic unrest on April the 11th. Going down the page, there's a lot of other paraphernalia here. Alright, uh, so, near-Earth asteroids, potentially hazardous asteroids, are space rocks larger than 100 metres, which can come close to Earth by about 0.05 AU, but none of the known potentially hazardous asteroids is on a current collision course with our planet, although astronomers are finding new ones all the time. As of the 8th of April, there are 1,992 potentially hazardous asteroids. And there's a big list of some of them there. Spaceweather.com Okay, I think that's about it for tonight. Now, I do, like I said, I do have Space Weather report from Tamitha. Um, that's ready and queued up, ready to go. Uh, but I shall run that as soon as I'm finished the uh, the broadcast here on HF. Um, I shall uh, conclude here, and uh, then I'll um, I'll run the uh, the video um, on the repeater, TV repeater, and also YouTube. Um, and that goes for about 15 minutes, actually. Um, so uh, <laughs> I would have been hard pressed fitting it into my one hour that I usually do, but I would have managed it. So, uh, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria's broadcast, ASV Radio, concluding transmissions on 160 metres, 1865. For stations listening there wishing to check in, please retune your radios to 3.541 kilohertz, or send me an email. So, thank you for listening on 1865 Amplitude Modulation. We've been running about 100 watts into a vertical antenna about 60 metres away. <coughs> and uh, everything looks like it's been running fairly good. So I just hope the AM signal has been heard reasonably well. Uh, more information about the Astronomical Society of Victoria can be found at www.asv.org.au. And uh, like I said, don't forget, uh, check into the ASV's YouTube channel this Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday. Uh, for a uh, for the monthly meeting, the ASV's monthly meeting, which will be streamed on on the ASV's YouTube website and also on the YouTube uh, on uh, the ASV's Facebook page. Um, okay, I think that's about it. 
So standby stations on 80 metres, I shall conclude transmissions on 1865. This is VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone, closing the transmitter down on 1865. Good evening. All right. <laughs> and we have the noise floor on 160 is just horrendous. Um, on AM it's, uh, it's about 22 over 9 really bad. My kingdom for a 40 acre plot of land somewhere out in the state of Victoria. Oh, I wish. All right, this is VK3 EKH. We are now going to switch across to 80 meters. Stations wishing to check in, please check in at now. Okay, <clears throat> VK3JR, VK3HDX, VK4BNQ, VK3VIN, and VK3AOB. Is there any other stations wishing to check in? Thanks, Tony. We've got you. There's another sub very, very weak, very weak indeed, but try again, VK3EKH. Well, I think that might be Kim, VK5 FUSF. I'll put you down there anyway for a, an attempted uh, FUS, FUSE. <laughs> attempted call in. <laughs> All right, let's go to the top of the list. See you there, Frank. Good evening. VK3 JR, VK3 EKH. VK3 Yeah, okay, Frank, VK3JR, <coughs> VK3EKH returning. Uh, if you just type in, um, yeah, my call sign, VK3CSJ uh, on uh, YouTube, uh, the YouTube search engine, just uh, type in VK3CSJ, Charlie, Sierra, Juliet, into the YouTube search engine. Uh, you'll come up with my page. And... Uh, mm, um, how else can I say this? Um, because what I'm indicating is that there's a uh, uh, there's a YouTube channel which will be live. Uh, it'll have live on it, and um, that's usually the uh, the only giveaway that I can really indicate. Um, it's not it's not as if it's a dedicated uh, a dedicated channel because I think if you type in VK3CSJ on YouTube, it will come up with a, like a lot of other videos there on my channel. So you have to find the one that's got live associated with it uh, probably the only other way to do that is to um, visit the ASV website that might be that might be the easiest thing to do if you've where, where, where I normally say uh, the YouTube stream is also on the ASV website um, the YouTube uh, uh, the ASV radio broadcast link that that uh, uh, is is available through the ASV website because that's just the channel that 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 vision there or that particular uh, um, uh, video side of it is is just associated uh, on that uh, particular page uh, so um, uh, yeah yes you can find that uh, by uh, going to the the Astronomical Society of Victoria's uh, uh, website and uh, selecting radio astronomy and then that'll open up a little box and at the bottom of that box will be a link to ASV 
uh, ASC Radio, uh, and that will open up. You'll there'll be a, a YouTube channel there. I hope that's easy for you, Frank. <laughs> um, it is uh, a little tricky to uh, to find, so uh, I hope hopefully you'll uh, you'll find that. My apologies for not being able to run it over HF. I I must work on that. I will work on that. I'll make it a promise for the audio side of the station to be sorted out by next Friday, <laughs> so I can so I can nevertheless run uh, the uh, the audio file uh, across. Um, I, I normally I can do it. Normally I can patch the audio through, but. Uh, it's uh, it gets a little tricky uh, with the uh, mixer behind me and vmix and everything else so I'm working on it anyway um, all right uh, now uh, across to Don VK3 HDX VK3 EKH Yeah, thanks, Don. VK3 HDX, VK3 EKH replying. Yeah, I'll be here. Uh, actually, I didn't think about that. Um, I suppose I could have said no. I'll take Friday off, but um, uh, no, that'll be fine. I'll uh, I'll make it a uh, an effort to be here <laughs> next uh, Friday. So, um, yep, there'll be a broadcast next Friday. Uh, I don't see any reason why uh, why not. So uh, no problems at all. Thanks for the report on 160 <coughs> and uh, and on 82 uh, not a problem Whew. I think I've got the air conditioner running in here but I don't know I feel hot for some reason uh, <laughs> thanks Don uh, VK4BNQ oh I think you were the fellow that came up last week I'm not sure can't remember your name sorry Peter can't, no, can't recall VK4BNQ VK3EKH go ahead Good on you there, Roger. VK4 B and Q, VK3 EKH replying. Well, you're just on the, the strength nine here. I've my <coughs> my noise level is about S8, strength eight, and uh, you're uh, uh, just moving that needle up to nine. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks for the report. Ten over nine is uh, is pretty good. Um, I'm happy with that. 
um, up there at Gympie. So, uh, yeah, good. Thanks, uh, Roger. Thanks for uh, um, taking a, uh, a listen to the broadcast outright. And, uh, yes, I think the YouTube uh, stream adds just that more interesting dimension to uh, to everything. Um, of course, the system, as, as I was saying, runs through uh, Melbourne TV repeater. The... Um, uh, the um, BATC site, yeah. Look, the it's, it's an ongoing issue with the repeater, TV repeater. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the sound is uh, usually for some reason always falls over. <laughs> uh, if uh, if not, it's the whole lot. So uh, it's a bit bit flaky. Uh, the um, input to uh, the BATC stream. Um, so uh, again, that's another reason why I uh, provide the YouTube uh, channel as well. Uh, all right, now I can see that uh, out of interest, I can see that Rob VK3KHN on the chat window has put up the latest um, uh, the latest uh, uh, solar report from Tamitha. Uh, it's uh, he's got that there. So thanks, um, uh, thanks Rob for that. So for anybody who's on the chat window the discord chat window uh, for uh, for the the ASV radio side uh, can also see the link that's provided by uh, Rob so thanks much for, that, for doing that Rob excellent stuff <laughs> such a Robert uh, and that's the other Rob not you Rob um, <laughs> it's just a comment he made oh boy anyway um, all right now uh, who was that next coming up Ian <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Ian. I'm just laughing over a comment on the uh, Discord. VK3, uh, Victor, India, November, Kangaroo Flat, VK3, EKH.
VK3, <coughs> VK3 VIN, VK3 EKH. Um, well, let's see, there's a couple of things there. Uh, what was the last comment about the audio side of things? Yeah, if actually I did uh, just uh, just before I, uh, um, I yeah just before I came to air tonight, I um, I had a bit of a play with the EQ on the microphone. Uh, so yeah, there is a bit more extra treble. The problem is my headphones failed last week. Now I had all week to fix the headphones, and it's not until I went to reach for them tonight that I realised oh I haven't re repaired the headphones. So I didn't, uh, um, a lot of the uh, um, audio checking that I do here is usually through the headphones and uh, um, so I, I went by ear and uh, I used uh, external speakers and stuff like that to uh, have a fiddle um, and that's often not good because you get feedback and all sorts of things happening. So uh, yeah, audio adjustments were made on the fly. Um, without headphones so uh, it could be a bit trebly I hope that's not uh, off-putting um, so uh, yes uh, let me know otherwise now the report about um, solar f the bigger solar flare I think I saw something I think I saw something but if you could send me a link uh, via the uh, ASV page uh, vk3 uh, ekh at gmail.com uh, send me a link oh, if you can find the article on that and uh, I shall uh, have a look and uh, I'll probably mention it next week so yeah, yes by all means uh, in uh, so definitely uh, send us a link um, ok on the uh, superior signal <laughs> and uh, what was the other question oh uh, are you, did you say you're running only 40 watts tonight just 40 watts right now is it over 20 Yeah, no, okay, no problem. That's okay, cool. Uh, all right, yeah, the low power I'm, I'm detecting, uh, so, uh, and the fact that you've uh, upped the ante just now has, has improved your signal from, uh, it was around about S9-ish to uh, 10 over now, so, um, uh, but yeah, okay, well, yeah, 20 watts, okay, pretty good. The band's not so bad tonight, there's no lightning crashes or anything happening, so we're, we're pretty good. Uh, all right, thanks, uh, Ian. Uh, across to you there, uh, Britt. G'day, once again, VK3AOB, VK3EKH. Yeah, good evening, all. Yeah, VK3, uh, VK3, EKH. Yeah, yeah, I did catch all of tonight's broadcast. I came home, I went to the pub, and uh, I left there about 20 past nine, came back here, and uh, I'll have a quick tune around, and uh, oh, there you were. And I'm, oh, that's right, I forgot. <laughs> Here, very solid. It's uh, five by nine, almost plus 50 dB. So I mean, you're just in the right, uh, jumping up 50 kilometres and slashing back down on top of me. So in a good position here. Uh, I'm running 100 watts. Um, currently working on the uh, uh, antenna farm out the back. I've been uh, doing the uh, heavy engineering of getting a 40 foot mast up and. Uh, I put in um, old gold uh, footings that screw into the ground. They had four inch saddles on them and running stainless bolts through it through the bottom of the pole. And uh, I'm hoping to stand one up tomorrow. So uh, I've just got the uh, uh, roughly rigged the, uh, uh, the 80 meter antenna to get, get to work. It's the ends of it are tied up on the uh, six foot. In the backyard, but um, yeah, it's actually working okay. Uh, yeah, good signal. Yeah, your audio sounds okay here, so um, uh, quite like it. Good evening, Roger. Well, I think we're mentioning it. In case our path doesn't cross again, <laughs> I'll probably be listening more, especially through the winter. We get uh, quiet. Uh, 80 metres comes into its own during the winter months, and hope you know the storms drop off. 
so there shouldn't be much lightning about. Um, the coffee would be good. Uh, every station I can hear is quite solid. Uh, Roger, 4BG, you're a 5x9 plus 5 dB, but quite respectable. If I switch the preamps and you come up to a bit above plus 20. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, nothing much to report from here. I've uh, always been inter interested in astronomy. I'd love to have a, a nice telescope, but they're just too expensive and hard to find, so <laughs> it's not a priority at the minute. But um, I certainly would like to get one down the track, like a large aperture type. <clears throat> I was running a place in uh, uh, Upway in 1983, and whoever had owned the house before us, or was renting it, had left us a very large, oh, it was a good six foot long tube, and uh, about a foot diameter reflector. Uh, there were no eyepieces, but I had looked through that. Oh, it was beautiful. Anyway, um, uh, someone I was living with uh, sold it. I came home one night to use it, and it's gone. So, uh, not too happy about that. It um, wasn't used to sell in the first place. But anyway, you get that. Um, yeah, so um, there you go. Um, yeah, not much else to. Um, to add, I guess. Um, I thought I'd pop in and say good day. So, uh, yeah, thank you, please. VK3 is Joe with the Chris. VK3, Alpha, Oscar, Bravo. No worries there, uh, Britt. VK3 A. Uh, uh, sorry. <clears throat> Yes, I was right. VK3 AOB, VK3 EKH uh, replying. Thanks, Britt. You're also a pretty good signal here tonight, um, about ho hovering around 30 over, so uh, uh, coming romping through as, as well. Yeah, I just, I, I know I'm, we're on a, an acre and a half of land here, and um, most of it's garden, um, and uh, the other percentage is just a, a house and the barn that I live in. If you if you go to qrz.com and type in vk3csj, you'll you'll see the barn and the studio if you haven't already done that. Uh, but the the land is mostly a lot of trees, and uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to get it to spread out some decent antennas. But I wouldn't mind um, putting up a few more long wire antennas around. In fact, I wouldn't mind uh, putting up something that works on. Um, on 630 um, kilohertz, no, was it 470 kilohertz? Yeah, that's right. And uh, having a bit of a play there because the uh, the NN 8000 that I've got here uh, works on 630 meters. That's what I was thinking of. So, um, but that requires a specialised antenna, a bit of fiddling around, a bit of space, a bit of height. Um, so we'll probably get there one day on that one, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, and the telescope too. Yeah, look, um, I occasionally I, I read a, an article out about buying your first telescope or, or the things to look out for uh, in um, really sort of uh, presents some uh, ideas, benchmarks to and things to look out for. Um, but you're quite right. For a decent telescope, you will be spending multiple hundred dollars and uh, it's it's better to do that than to be disappointed so um, so ie you know stay away from the cheap telescopes that you would find uh, in Kmart shops and the like um, those little long uh, uh, cylindrical tube things that are on flimsy tripods they they're only uh, they only look good in the corner of your lounge room uh, but uh, to, to look at anything through the at the sky through them uh, it'd be frustrating uh, because uh, an object no, no sooner would you focus on some star uh, that it would be out of view of the screen and um, uh, it's they're not good you know not, not good at all so um, yes uh, the recommendation would be certainly to uh, to uh, get a Dobsonian type telescope a preferably a, an 8 inch mirror uh, and a Dobsonian telescope that you can freely move around to any part of the sky quickly and at ease and um, uh, and uh, you can track, well when I say track you can move the telescope with uh, ease to keep an object in view it depends on the eyepiece you use too of course um, but they're not that, they're that expensive those telescopes, type of telescopes and but you'll get good results um, 
yeah, anyway, uh, all right. Um, and one thing I keep I haven't mentioned for a while, the uh, there is a local observatory um, here. It's um, up at um, Mount Burnett, Mount Burnett Observatory. It's a observatory that used to be owned by the Monash University crowd, uh, but uh, it's now been taken over by a group of uh, uh, astronomical enthusiasts, um, friends of Mount Burnett Observatory, you might call them. Um, but uh, they have uh, access to the observatory, and they're they're up there. <coughs> they're up there every Friday night, um, uh, entertaining um, the members up there. And if the sky is clear, they'll uh, they'll open up the shutter and uh, use the telescope. So the Mount Burnett Observatory is uh, is quite a uh, a nice little place to visit. It's only about 20 minutes away from here. So um, yeah, it's good to see that that's uh, still running. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Britt, and uh, for uh, remembering to come in. <laughs> I, uh, the, the pub's an important place to visit, so I, I can understand that. <laughs> Mind you, I haven't been to a pub for a long time. Um, thanks, Britt. Uh, uh, Tony, do you want to have a quick say? VK3VAT, uh, VK3EKH. Yeah, thanks, Tony. VK3VAT, VK3EKH. Tony's a, a real local amateur, <coughs> um, about 200 kilometres, I mean, two 2,000 metres away. <laughs> um, we could throw a stone and... Uh, oh, there was another... You know, I was just thinking, there was... Um, there was at least another two or three uh, articles I, I could have run tonight, too. There was uh, an article on space.com website about... If you were on the surface of the moon and you were a professional golfer, how far would a golf ball travel if you hit a golf ball on the moon? And uh, it's uh, something like 4,800 metres. But I'll, I'll leave that for next Friday. That's an article for next Friday. I don't know why I didn't uh, put that on. Anyway, not to worry. I don't know why I thought of that, but <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tony. Good, to, good to hear you. Good signal and um, plenty of audio. There's not about uh, no doubt about that. All right, now there was one other station. I think it might have been Kim VK5 SU FUSE. Uh, we shall take one listen. VK3, sorry, VK5 FUSE. If that was you, VK3 EKH listening. Yeah, thanks, Kim. VK5 FUSE, VK3 EKH. Unfortunately, my changeover relay in the uh, the, the amplifier didn't kick into the receive mode, so uh, but I could still hear you. There was still enough leakage uh, to to uh, go over the relay contacts, <laughs> um, but I, I didn't catch uh, everything you said. But I, I heard have a good weekend and. Um, there was something else you said there too, but uh, unfortunately my, my changeover relay is, is a bit sticky and uh, it didn't uh, kick in. It's been okay so far, just now it's decided to uh, stay open, bloody thing. Anyway, 
<laughs> Thanks, Kim. And I can see you up there on uh, the, the Discord channel. So uh, Discord that's your page, so not a problem at all. Thanks, Kim. Good on you, mate. Thanks for calling in. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Any other stations wishing to check in before we conclude? VK3 EKH listening. Uh, VK, another, I think it was VK4. VK4 something something. Who was the other station that just checked in? That was a VK7. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, good. No worries. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Gotcha. VK7JAH. Um, all right. Uh, okay, my relay didn't kick in. I've got to go up and hit the, the amplifier. <laughs> anyway, we've got you. VK7JAH. Go ahead, Martin. VK3EKH. Yeah, okay, yeah, Martin, just a bit tricky to hear, VK3, sorry, VK7JAH, VK3EKH. Yes, look, the uh, the changeover relay in that, I don't know if you're watching YouTube or the repeater, but that linear that's just behind me there, an old Heathkit thing, um, it's, uh, the changeover relay is sticking for some reason, so I'm going to have to uh, have a bit of a, a squirt of some WD-40 in it. <laughs> I can just... Then it's going, no, no, but... No, I won't be using WD-40. Um, anyway... It's a joke. That's just a joke. Um, <laughs> thanks, Martin. Thanks for calling in. We got you in the logbook. That's the main thing. And um, uh, Kim, Kim's just made a comment there on the uh, chat window. He says, uh, uh, "Good broadcast as usual. Uh, good night for stargazing, uh, friends on Discord, um, and turn over nine on eighty. So, yep. Look, I'm obviously getting out pretty well, as Britt uh, pointed out before." Uh, as we get into the cooler months, into uh, into winter, uh, 80 metres uh, really does come into its own. So um, uh, I know that we've had uh, over the years uh, a, a number of VK6s uh, even check in on um, on the callback, including ZL, uh, but we haven't heard too, too many of those uh, stations there for a little while, actually. All right, if there's been no other stations, we shall conclude the uh, 80 metre service tonight. <laughs> And um, we'll run uh, Tamitha's latest solo report. It goes for 15 minutes, uh, so it's fairly detailed. And uh, it covers up to the, to, uh, to the end of the weekend, I think. I think that the uh, date that I saw was uh, up until uh, the week this weekend, so it's, it'll be current enough to, uh, to give you a bit of an idea what's been going on in, uh, in the, the, uh, the world of our sun space weather as well. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel uh, concluding the uh, broadcast tonight on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria and um, we'll just continue on for a little bit longer with the YouTube stream and the uh, session through the repeater, TV repeater and we'll try and get the audio situation sorted out so we don't have uh, this problem for next week. This is VK3 EKH, Echo VK3 CSJ uh, concluding on 3541 kilohertz. Good evening everyone. I was only joking. <laughs> All right. Now, and my changeover relay still hasn't check, checked in. Oh, dear. All right, now, for those still watching the television repeater, VK3 RTV Digital Channel 1, the BATC feed that's got no audio, and the YouTube stream, uh, I shall now go straight across to Timothy Scove. Uh, do I have her? Yes, I do. Um, so, Tim Vescove, WX6SWW is her call sign. WX6SWW, SWW being for Space Weather Woman. Appropriate call sign. So, uh, let me see how we go with that. After 12 M-class flares, one X-class flare, three radiation storms, and two Earth-directed solar storms, we finally get to say goodbye to Region 2975. And you'd think that would be the end of big solar activity. But nope. Those stories and more in the news this week. 
This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week has been a flurry of activity, but finally things are beginning to calm down. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, the big culprit has been region 2975 that has fired no less than 12 M-class flares and even one X-class flare. In fact, you can see the X-class flare right on uh, the 30th Pow! Right there, that's when it fires the X-class flare. It sends an Earth-directed solar storm and one of three different radiation storms that it actually sent toward Earth. We get got an, an M-class flare almost every day after that, including more solar storms being launched. But goodness, thank gosh, it's finally leaving the Earth-facing disk. It's now rotating to the Sun's far side. And not before it fires one last goodbye kiss, Bang! Right there, that was yet another uh, solar storm launch and a big M-class flare and a radiation storm. Oh my goodness, will this thing ever quiet down? Luckily, as it rotates to the sun's far side, we won't have to be in the path of its noise anymore or its solar storms. So we think that things are finally going to be able to quiet down, but we have other regions on the Earth-facing disk that are also big flare players. We have region 2976, 2978, and 81. They are still big flare players, so we are going to have to watch out for them. On top of that, on the third, whoosh, you can see there's a filament eruption. That region is actually an Earth-directed solar storm now. So we have yet another Earth-directed solar storm, and it looks like it could hit us as early as the 7th, but we're waiting for coronagraphs and for the prediction models to be sure. Meanwhile, while we have other ro regions rotating into Earth view, these regions from the sun's far side are not only going to keep that solar flux boosted well into the triple digits, which is good for amateur radio uh, operators and emergency responders, but we also may have more chances for aurora and big flares, so everybody is going to need to stay vigilant even through this upcoming week. Switching to our M-Flare threat meter, as we take a look at the X-ray flux, oh my goodness, look at all of the activity this week. In fact, when we try to get look at the background level for the X-ray flux, it's sitting almost at the M-Flare levels, way above the seafloor. And this explains why the amateur radio bands have been so noisy this week on Earth's day side. In fact, you can count how many M-Class flares and even an X-Class flare. This X-Class flare occurred on the 30th. It was almost an X-1. 1.4. All of these flares have been uh, from region 2975. A lot of them have accompanied Earth-directed solar storms and radiation storms. But luckily, things, as you can see, starting around the third, things begin to kind of drop a little bit. That's because region 2975 is finally that bad actor we can finally wave goodbye to as it rotates to the sun's far side. And this means things are going to get a little bit quieter on the radio bands, but solar flux, luckily, is going to continue to stay in the triple digits, so we're going to continue to have uh, decent radio propagation on Earth's day side. Switching to our solar radiation storm meter, over this past week, we actually have had quite a bit of activity. In fact, starting around the 28th, you can see we popped up over the S1 uh, radiation storm threshold. This was due to region 2975 beginning to fire off those big M-class flares. And oftentimes when you get those big events, you'll also get a radiation storm as well. In fact, even as this one began to die down, we got hit again on the 31st. This was once again due to that X-class flare. And this this was actually a delayed radiation storm, which uh, scientists are going to be studying for quite some time, I'm pretty sure. And then things died back down and we got hit yet again. So we've had three radiation storms as of uh, at right now. Hopefully that's going to be it. Things are going to finally kind of calm down because we know radiation storms cause issues for high latitude communications and navigation, as well as uh, cause issues for high risk passengers in airline flights. Switching to our solar storm conditions, you can see over this past week, we actually started off at pretty quiet conditions, basically quiet to unsettled. We did get a pocket of fast solar wind right around the 28th that gave us a little bit of active conditions, but not too much before things settled down. But that was kind of the quiet before the storm, because right about then was when region 2975 really started lighting off and firing solar storms at us. In fact, by the 31st, we got hit by that first solar storm. That jumped us up 
to, uh, to active and then to storm levels. And then we thought we were really going to get a big solar storm. We were supposed to be a G2, possibly even a G3 level. But believe it or not, the storm was configured the wrong way magnetically. So it actually ended up being more of a bumper car. And that didn't allow a lot of energy to, to kind of be pumped into the Earth system. So we remained around active conditions, which was kind of like a whew, to a lot of people, I think. And things to kind of calm down, even though we did get some gorgeous aurora deep into mid-latitudes. And then, in fact, we actually had yet another solar storm hit us right about the second. It kind of grazed us, which was enough to bump us back up into storm levels. But once again, the conditions weren't exactly right. We still got some decent aurora, but it didn't send us into deep uh, storm levels. And things began to calm down and calm down. And thank goodness we're calming down even more. But stay tuned, because we do have that, that other solar storm that looks like it's headed toward Earth, and it could hit us as early as the 7th. So Aurora photographers, we may not be done quite yet. Now switching to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And you can see that solar storm coming out. Now this is the one that was launched on the 3rd. We do have a solar storm that was launched before this, and it should be grazing Earth off to the west right around the 5th or so. But we're not expecting much from it. Meanwhile, as this one comes towards Earth, it looks like the impact is going to be late on the 6th and into the 7th and it's not supposed to be a huge storm but it could definitely bring us some more aurora down to mid latitudes especially with how rattled the earth shield has been as of late so aurora photographers definitely keep those batteries charged don't put those cameras away just yet because you're going to get yet another chance and during the recent series of solar storms, we have had some gorgeous aurora in many parts of the world. And I can't possibly show all the aurora photos I've seen, but I will show some this week and then some in the following week. And thank you to all of the aurora photographers and field reporters out there who've been sending these gorgeous photos in. They're just unbelievably stunning. Like this set in Russia. An aurora was seen in Denmark. And it was seen in Scotland and down in Ireland. And it was seen in Norfolk in the UK. And as we go into the Atlantic, it was also seen in Iceland. And as we go into the Western Hemisphere, it was seen all over Canada, despite the clouds. It was seen in Quebec and in Ontario. It was seen in multiple places in Manitoba. And it was seen in Saskatchewan. It was also seen in Alberta. And in British Columbia. And as we dip down into the United States, Aurora was seen in many places, including as far south as South Dakota. And it was seen in Michigan. We had some beautiful views in Iowa and in Minnesota. We also had aurora in Montana and at least as far south as Washington State. But it was also seen in parts of Wyoming and clear down in Nebraska. And down south, the aurora australis was also seen where it wasn't too cloudy. And that means multiple places in New Zealand. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a little bit from the side. And when we take a look at Stereo's view, man, we do see a lot of regions in view, including a bunch on the east limb. We also have a coronal hole that hasn't rotated into Earth view yet. That coronal hole will be rotating into Earth view and possibly giving us some more fast solar wind in about two weeks. 
weeks or so, and that will be great for Aurora photographers in case some of these solar storms keep fizzling on us. Meanwhile, it looks like the solar flux is going to easily stay within the triple digits. In fact, we're going to be creeping back up to 150 again, and that means great radio propagation on Earth's day side. But it does look like we do have a few other storm players here, and possibly some big flare players as well. And that may mean that activity isn't going to quiet down, even though Region 2975 has now rotated to the far side. Switching to our moon, we are now coming out of the new moon phase on our way to a first quarter, with the first quarter being on the 9th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, this companion's beginning to brighten up a little bit, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that uh, solar storm that's Earth-directed that was launched on the 3rd. Now this is going to come on the tail of some high-speed solar wind from a small coronal hole that's just been passing through the Earth strike zone right now. At high latitudes, NOAA's expecting major storm conditions. As a matter of fact, as a uh, up to about a 60% chance of a major storm, and this should last easily in as we go into the weekend, then things will begin to calm down. Now, mid-latitudes, we're only expecting active to minor storm conditions, but we do have up to about a 20 to 25% chance of a major storm, and that's really because we've already had our Earth's magnetic shield be so rattled recently from all of the solar storms that we've been dealing with. So it's kind of hard to tell right now exactly how the Earth is going to fare. But aurora photographers, this definitely means you have more chances for aurora, especially down at mid-latitudes. Things may be a little bit fleeting, but it's definitely worth a shot if you can get out and chase. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, thank goodness region 2975 has finally rotated to the sun's far side, but that doesn't mean the big flare risk is over quite yet. We do have a couple flare players on the Earth-facing disk, and that's why things are still in the yellow. In fact, uh, NOAA's giving us about a 15% chance of M-class flares over the next couple days, but things should continue to settle down as time moves on. But this does mean that you GPS users, especially on Earth's day side, we do still have a risk for radio blackouts. So that means GPS reception could be impacted, especially near dawn and dusk, so be vigilant. Also, we're keeping our solar flux uh, easily up into the triple digits. We're still sitting in the high 130s to almost 140s right now, and that's likely going to continue. This means good radio propagation on Earth's day side, despite still some noise on the band. So amateur radio operators, you're going to have to deal with that a little bit. And then also, you know, remember, on Earth's night side, we do have that solar storm coming, and that will impact reception both for you GPS users and your radio operators. So just be aware of that especially near Aurora. Now, also, we are still dealing with the kind of a waning radiation storm right now. We aren't expecting any more radiation storms. We do have about a 15%, maybe a 10% risk for an additional storm, but likely that's just going to be a little bit too over zealous. We're probably not going to have anything else hit us uh, because region 2975 has rotated to the sun's far side and let's hope the sun can kind of keep it quiet for a little while. That means we're going to be going back down to the D1 normal range here in the next few days and this is great news for uh, you airline passengers. It looks like we're going back into the green and things should stay like that for some time. So instead of ratcheting down the space weather this week, we're still on pins and needles. Even though region 2975 is now rotated off of the Earth-facing disk, is on the sun's far side so we can say goodbye to big X-class flares and likely radiation storms, we may not be out of the woods when it comes to big M flares, and we're definitely not out of the woods when it comes to Earth-directed solar storms, because there are still players on the Earth-facing disk right now. Aurora photographers, we could have a solar storm hit us possibly graze us by the 7th, so you may get another chance for more Aurora shots, so definitely keep your batteries charged. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, the amateur band should be quieting down uh, on Earth's day side, and that is good news. Don't worry, the solar flux isn't going away anytime soon, but also be aware that you could still get radio blackouts over the next week, because we do still have big flare players on the Earth's day side, so just hang in there. 
And now you GPS users, well, thank goodness most of the radio blackouts have died out and the radiation storms are also dying down, so at high latitudes at least GPS reception will be better. But we do still have another Earth-directed solar storm, and that does mean that you could have issues, especially on Earth's night side, anywhere near Aurora. Be sure to uh, check your, your reception, and also if you happen to be a drone pilot, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Tamitha. So that went. Uh, that was one of her longest reports that I've uh, I've had. Fifteen minutes. So uh, all very good. And um, the report uh, just skims the the pardon me the uh, beginning of the weekend. So um, there should be some interesting uh, atmospheric conditions happening. Um, so if you're into DX on HF, uh, yep, turn your radios on and take a listen. Uh, hmm. All right, I think that's uh, about it from me. So thank you for watching the AT Ferry Peter, everybody out there. And uh, this uh, uh, there will be the WIA broadcast this coming uh, Sunday at 10:30, courtesy of Bevan VK5BD, and uh, I might run um, the solar report again on Sunday morning after it. And uh, uh, and of course repeat it again at eight o'clock in the evening. And then there's the uh, other highlight of the week, the ATV net, on Tuesday at eight o'clock in the evening. This week being hosted by uh, Ian VK3 Quebec Lima. Uh, so um, he'll be hosting it, and um, hopefully I'll be there as well this time. So, uh, on that note, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, uh, VK3 CSJ on the microphone, concluding for tonight. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll be back next Easter Friday to do it all again, uh, and hopefully I'll get the audio sorted out. <laughs> it's a big problem. So, VK3 EKH, uh, concluding for tonight. Where's my grey sky? There it is, colour bars. That'll do.